Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 13th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, one of the largest mass casualty events in American history. <laughs> Booming calls for gun control even though the killer had passed multiple background checks. Florida doesn't regulate assault weapons or 50 caliber, caliber rifles or large capacity ammunition magazines. It doesn't require a permit to purchase a gun. It doesn't require any registration whatsoever. And no time is wasted blaming conservatives for the actions of the ISIS pledged murderer. That's next. Well, it didn't take very long for the horrific shooting, the mass murder in Orlando, to turn to gun control. That was very predictable, and of course that has happened. And as we look at this, remember that it was fast and furious where the administration, not only Obama, but also the George W. Bush administration, because this is something that is part of the Washington establishment, the bureaucracy, the ATF, shipping guns across the border in order to undermine and destroy the Second Amendment. Now what we have is not guns and this, but we now have gunmen being shipped across the border. That's what Barack Obama is doing with his version of Fast and Furious. But let's take a look at the reality of what happens. In Orlando, this happened again in a gun-free zone. If you have a concealed carry, you're not allowed to take it into a bar, for example. This is reported by the New American. They say a concealed weapons statute says that a license issued under this section in Florida does not authorize any person to openly carry a handgun or carry a concealed weapon or firearm into any portion of an establishment licensed to dispense alcoholic beverages for consumption on the premises. In other words, this could be done at any bar anywhere in Florida because they're all gun-free zones. And of course, the New American asked the question, well, you know, what would have happened if somebody had been there with a gun? They could have stopped it in just three minutes. And they give you a couple of examples. If you think that's an exaggeration, they say that's how long it took to end the potential killing spree at Vaughn Foods in Moore, Oklahoma. Remember that in 2014, where an irate employee cut off someone's head? Okay. It didn't take very long before somebody who had it concealed is about three minutes before somebody with a concealed weapon shut that down. Then again, there was another attack in January 2014 at the Mystic Strip Club. A guy got upset. He returned with a handgun, gunned down the bouncer, killed a patron, killed a waitress. But another bouncer who had a gun killed him and did that in about three minutes. That's how long it took for a doctor at Mercy Fitzgerald Hospital in Philadelphia to end the rampage in July 2014. He had a psychiatric patient who wanted to commit mayhem and murder, but he was shut down by a good guy with a gun. Now, I think it's interesting that before this happened, a week ago, we were going to cover it on last Tuesday's Nightly News when we did the live coverage of the last primaries in California because there's massive gun control bills coming out of California. And Jakari and I had this to talk about the fact that the NRA had already cut and was running in California to try to oppose these newer, more draconian gun laws in California where they already have more gun laws than anywhere else. And they cut this, this ad to show a woman being attacked in a parking garage. And then they cut another version for LGBT voters. And they, the title of this is, and we're going to show this, you can see that right there. You can see that he's attacking her in the parking lot. The title of that is, Take Away Our Rights, Take Away Our Life. And that's what you see at the very end of that. They ran one with women. And then they ran another one with the transgender people. They said they were going to target that in areas with large concentrations of LGBT Californians. And then we see, less than a week later, that's precisely what happened. But they're not allowed because it is a bar. You can't carry that. Now, we've seen record gun sales through May, and I'm sure it's going to pop up. We've already seen gun stocks take a huge surge on Wall Street today in the aftermath of this. Every time this happens, the public knows that you need guns to protect yourself, even though our politicians want to shut that down. And of course, we've had 13 months every month setting a new record high. How do we know that? Well, it's because the FBI is doing background checks on people when they buy this. This doesn't even include private sales that are happening. But even with the background checks at a 
uh, retail outlet, we see this happening. But what do the Democrats want? The Democrats want more gun laws, saying that that's going to shut this down. And of course, key on the gun control list is background checks. Did that really make a difference with this particular individual? Let's take a look at his background, okay? This is a guy who worked for the largest security firm in the world, G4S, okay? He worked there for eight years, since 2007. So he is vetted by the largest private security firm in the world. He was also vetted by the state government. Look at this article from Bipart. Omar Mateen was background checked and had statewide firearm licenses, okay? Number one, he possessed a security officer license in Florida, but he also possessed a statewide firearms license. Background checks are required for both the security officer license and the statewide firearms license. Those checks included a thorough criminal check as well. He would have had to pass such checks in order to acquire his licenses and to possess firearms. Now, this is some from somebody who has been an FBI person of interest. He's been investigated three times by the FBI because of his connections to radical Islam, as well as complaints of other people. So here's someone, the largest security firm in the world, eight years. He's been investigated by the FBI three times. He's been given state licenses, statewide firearms licenses. He's been investigated when he bought his guns, okay? None of that made any difference. None of those background checks made any difference. They're doing this simply to shut down your ability to protect yourself, just like they shut down your ability to protect yourself if you have a concealed carry. If you've gone through and been completely vetted, they don't want you to be able to protect yourself at any bar. And then understand that it wasn't just the private security firm, the state government, the FBI that vetted him. Also, Homeland Security. He's part of a group that is tasked with transporting illegal aliens who are other than Mexican further into the country. That's part of the work that he does. And of course, this private security firm also does guarding of federal buildings. They also do guarding of nuclear reactors. So that should make you feel real good about the background checks. And if they're doing those kinds of background checks to him and he's getting a pass, and oh, by the way, when the FBI did the investigation of him, they came and they said, well, why did they investigate? One of the reasons that they investigated him was because he came from the same radical mosque where a suicide bomber in Syria came from. Now, FBI Director Comey said the FBI could find no uh, connection of consequence. They said that a witness told the Bureau that he also uh, had watched a lot of, mentioned, talked a lot about Anwar al-Awlaki, the guy who was assassinated by drone in 2011. And one of the reasons that Comey gave for shutting down the investigation was that he was a security guard. He had been investigated by that private security firm as well. So you see, all these different agencies are looking at this, and everybody says, well, everybody else passed him, so I guess he's okay. I, I guess that's the way it works. Now, what is the real issue here? Well, Obama is telling us that he's a homegrown terrorist, okay? But there's some other issues as well. If we go back and we look at where he was radicalized, where it's not just that he was radicalized because he was American, okay? He was also had a lot of different influences on him. One of those key influences, besides his father, okay, who was uh, not expressed really any grief as far as I can tell or any sympathy for the victims, he simply said in passing, well, God will take care of punishing the homosexuals. We don't really need to do that ourselves. But he didn't condemn the actions of his son. I didn't see him offering any sympathy or condolences to the victim's families. No, he just said God will take care of those people. You know, he's going to uh, take care of them, so we don't have to do it. But he also was sitting at the feet of a guy named Marcus Dwayne Robertson, also known as Abu Taba. He managed to convert 36 people while he was in prison to his poisonous version of Islam, reports the Daily Mail. He spent four years in jail. He was considered so dangerous that he was kept shackled with his own security detail away from other inmates. He was radicalizing people inside of the prison. They believe that he radicalized 36 other people, so they kept him in solitary confinement. Now, he'd previously been a Marine. He was also a bank robber, and then he turned FBI informant, but eventually the FBI said that they gave up on him when he attacked his CIA handler. So you got the FBI, you got the CIA. You got all these people connected. Finally, he was thrown back in 2011. He was thrown back into jail for tax fraud. Prosecutors tried to get another 10 years added to his sentence after discovering documents preaching terrorism. But a judge released him last year. So you see how this goes? We've got the FBI involved with him. They don't do anything. The CIA doesn't do anything. They make him an informant. And then you've got a judge who releases him in spite 
of all this that happens. Take a look at the seminary that he's got, Timbuktu Seminary in Orlando. It's not really a coincidence that this happened there. And when Barack Obama says that this is homegrown terrorism, he should know. He should know. I don't think I can refer to him as President Obama anymore. I think I'm going to start calling him Imam Obama or maybe just Imama. Look at this Timbuktu uh, Seminary. This is at the same time that Senator Markey in Massachusetts, a big gun control Democrat, told us that this guy was radicalized by the Internet. No, he was radicalized by the guy that runs that website. Are they taking that down? No. They keep him in prison? No. You got a judge, you got the FBI, you got the CIA releasing this guy. That should tell you something, shouldn't it? Now, look at that. If you look at that website, of course, that is free for all Muslims. And if you look at what he is promoting there, uh, it is all about Islam. But of course, we can't say that Islam is radical. We can't say that there's any connection to that, even though we've got one mosque that he attended that generates suicide bombers. And then we've got this site that, where he took classes at a seminary, okay? And it didn't teach him. Let me say this. If they didn't teach him to become a murderous terrorist, they didn't teach him to not become a murderous terrorist. You see, you see the issue there? If he was following another religion, I know about Christianity, I don't know about the other religions, but I believe the other religions would have told him not to do that. Why, if he was a student at this seminary, why, if he went to that mosque, why did they tell him not to do that, that that was prohibited? No, I think it was encouraged, as a matter of fact. You know, when we look at what's going on with Obama, within 30 minutes, 9-11 knew that this guy had sworn allegiance to ISIS, that he had praised other terrorists. But Obama couldn't bring himself to say it for more than 12 hours, that this guy was a radical Islamicist, that it was terrorism, even though they knew that. And of course, as we mentioned earlier on the radio show today, as an FBI agent let that slip, they came back and pushed against that narrative, even though they knew 30 minutes into this, they knew, and it went on for three hours, 30 minutes into it, they knew that this was a terrorist event. You know, when I look back at the reports that we did about the billionaire space race, we remember JFK because he, his goal was to put a man on the moon in 10 years. Obama doesn't have a goal to colonize the moon. He doesn't have a goal to colonize Mars. Obama has a goal to colonize the United States with Islam. He had his NASA director say that his most important mission as NASA director was to reach out to Muslims. This is the guy that we have here. Now, when he talks about his homegrown terrorism, where are these people coming from? Well, he's bringing them in as fast as he can, and he's not vetting them even anywhere close to the extent that this fellow was vetted. And, of course, we see that they didn't do a very good job even of that. They don't even try or, not, or don't have the information to, bring, to vet the people that they're now bringing in. Breitbart reports Afghanistan immigration has surged in America and that 99% of them support Sharia law. That is according to Pew. And if we look at the number of people coming in between 2001 and 2013, the U.S. permanently resettled 30,000 Afghan migrants on green cards. Now, in the next five years, they point out, without changes to our visa dispensations that we're handing out, the encouragement that we're giving to people, and of course Obama is trying to accelerate this. He's got his goal of bringing in 10,000 Syrians this year calling them refugees. This is the first time we've been totally unable, they say, to help people in country. So we have to bring them here to America. We can't stop the war. We can't give them a safe place. We can't give them aid in country. No, they have to come here and we have to accelerate this. And so in 2014, what we saw was a 379% increase in the number of Afghan migrants that came into this country. Now, this may help to explain what is going on with Obama and uh, the immigration. We see today on the Daily Mail reported that uh, actually it happened this weekend. John Brennan, who is very close to Obama, went to Saudi Arabia and said on their national television with his comments dubbed into Arabic that he says, I think the 28 pages will be published. These are the secret 28 pages uh, in the 9-11 report that have been heavily redacted. He says, I think they will be published and I support their publication and everyone will see the evidence that the Saudi government had nothing to do with it. Well, then why has the CIA and John Brennan tried to cover this up for so long? We've got people like Bob Graham, former senator, head of the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, Bob Kerry, former senator, uh, Lehman, who is a Reagan Navy secretary. The other two fellows were uh, Democrat senators. Walter Jones, a Republican congressman. All of them have said, declassify this, 
It shows the connection of Saudi Arabia. As a matter of fact, the Saudis were very concerned. They threatened to dump $750 billion of treasury bills to try to disrupt our economy, to try to blackmail us into not letting that information out, and to try to blackmail us into not allowing the families uh, of the victims to sue Saudi Arabia if they have any involvement in that. So they've kept this very secret, and yet we have John Brennan coming in and saying, don't worry, I'm sure they'll not find anything there. Maybe he will help to explain that away. You know, it was uh, last year, last August, that we had some articles questioning whether or not John Brennan was a Muslim convert. In this article from the D.C. Clothesline, they point out that in September of 18th, 2014, a whistleblower named Greg Ford of the 20, 223rd Military Intelligence Battalion claimed that Brennan, as chief of the CIA in Jeddah, overrode concerns and ordered the visas of the 19 so-called plane hijackers to be stamped. He said he was the person who did it. Now, also, Wayne Madsen, our reporter, has pointed out when he took his oath, he said it looks like maybe he had a problem, that this guy is no longer Catholic. He said he refused to take an oath on the Bible. He took it on the U.S. Constitution. He says he's the highest-ranking U.S. official to ever have visited Mecca, a privilege reserved only for pious Muslims. And finally, he says as National Security Council and at the CIA, he has forbidden the use of the term jihadist, just like Imam Obama. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Our reporter Joe Biggs speaks to survivors in Orlando. Our InfoWars reporter Joe Biggs is on location in Orlando. He's talking to survivors and to the family and friends of survivors. Many of them have told him they believed that there were multiple shooters in the event. But the Orlando Police Department was quick to move to try to dispel rumors of multiple shooters. According to Orlando Channel 10, uh, they reported talking to the police, and here's a tweet. They say, rumors of multiple shooters are unfounded. The one shooter, Omar Mateen, is dead. That's the Orlando police. There you go. They're not going to look at anything other than a lone shooter. Isn't it interesting? It's always a lone wolf shooter. They never have any help. Nobody's ever holding a door closed. There's never another shooter, even though there's usually reports of multiple shooters. Now we have reports from uh, Joe Biggs. I want to go to this uh, one interview that I have. He's got multiple interviews on YouTube. But this particular fellow made a very good point, made a lot of good points. But he said, look, if you take away the guns, this guy had bombs. They're going to have bombs. They're going to set fires. Whatever they need to do, they're suicide terrorists. Here's that report. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now I'm joined today with Chris Enzo. Chris Enzo. So you actually had a friend who was in the club that night when it happened early Sunday morning, late Saturday evening, however you look at it, and he was injured. And you said you're you're familiar with this area and what goes on here. Tell me what you've heard from someone who was actually there, what you guys know so far. Well, what Rodney, who is my friend who was a bartender that got shot three times, said in his own words is that when he was there, he specifically witnessed the assailant coming in. He saw that this guy... He didn't think he was going to be a threat. He just saw him coming in. So then moments after that, pulls out a rifle with semi-automatic uh, capabilities and it was shooting, you know, big caliber bullets. As soon as that happens, he literally hears the sound of bullets hitting people's skin, bullets piercing flesh, bullets breaking bones, people screaming, people um, crying, people in pandemonium. Uh, the other guy said that there was bodies dropping everywhere. And that the thing with Rodney said that was so crazy to him is that the person that he was serving in front of him, the person he was bartending with, died in front of him right before he got shot three times. And then the force of those bullets caused him to fall to the floor. And when he fell to the floor, that's when he was, one, uh, had to come to terms with the hardest decision of his life, whether or not he was going to live or die. And two, he was really waiting for a ceasefire. But he says not only was there never a ceasefire, the thing that no one has really addressed yet is that there he is convinced and he is a smart guy he really is a smart guy that there was more than one assailant in that in that shooting he believes that he heard two semi-automatic guns going off at the same time and one of the one of the shooters was obviously you know the the main shooter the one that we're talking about very calculated all the 102 or 103 people that were hit there was no mistakes there was like from what i understand there's no bullets that like missed there's bullets just hitting people like this was 
premeditated, well calculated, and extremely thought out from someone who's very skilled at hitting moving targets. Yeah, what we heard from multiple sources thus far, there was an ABC report. This guy was talking on the phone saying that someone was holding the door shut, right. that, uh, that they heard multiple gunfire as well. And that's the, the word on the street that there could have been multiple uh, terrorists in there involved in this. But yet the mainstream media keeps saying it's just this one guy, that's it. It was kind of like a random thing. The guy went in there because he'd seen two guys in Miami make out and it upset him. And now that his father's come out and made videos, right. you know, condoning violence against homosexuals, things like that. So, I mean, like... There are some things that are not being addressed in the main media right now. That is one. The assailants had bombs on their chest, right? That's something that we keep skipping over, and that's something that I think we need to be very well aware of, because even if gun laws were out, stores and people couldn't have gun laws and all this stuff, I feel like this guy would have set the place on fire. I feel like this guy would have built a bigger bomb. This guy would have found a way to commit destruction. Number two, it really feels like some sleeper cell shit is happening since we just had this other girl get killed in, in, in the exact same right down the road. weird phenomenon in the same area. It almost feels like these people were tasked with coming out to Orlando to commit chaos and murder and kill people and um, you know between the, the multiple assailants maybe someone holding the door um, the bomb and then the fact that not too long ago there was a shooting right here a girl uh, Christina Grimmie got shot in like the same manner a person came from St. Pete or St. Port St. Lucie or what, one, yeah. one of them this guy drove out here went killed her shot her in the head then killed himself then this guy this guy knew that he was going to die doing this. So this is an act of terror in in the highest form of committing terrorism as far as a one or two man army can commit. That's that's a that, that's just amazing when you sit here and think about that, you know. And how's your friend doing right now? Unfortunately, um, I well when I spoke to him yesterday, we were in high hopes that he'd be uh, having a good surgery, but at the moment I just got word that his surgery is undergoing some complications because what I said earlier in the interview is that they did not do a frag check on him which means they did not check the, his body for fragments because they just do not have the staff at um, or Orlando Regional to go through and do everything that is needed to do for every single patient but that complication of the fragment that he has in his body may be a small thing and he may be on his way to a very good recovery. Um, Rodney himself is a strong-willed person He's a little bit older than me. He's got a girlfriend, daughter, you know, he's two kids. He's got, um, he's been a model. He's, he's a really big guy, really kind, loving guy. I know people think this was an act of hate, but um, I myself am straight. I'm, I'm a hetero, and um, so is Rodney. But Rodney and myself and everyone else here in Orlando does support the LGBT community. Everyone is okay with them and what they're doing, and nobody wants to commit hateful crimes against people that are not doing anything to, to, to warrant being murdered in the highest form of terrorist attack that we've seen since 9-11. Yeah, it's ridiculous. People keep saying that this is, like you said, an act of hate. President Obama even came out and said this is an act of hate. And what that does, that takes focus off of the fact of what it really is. The fact that we have a commander in chief of president who won't even say radical Islam. These guys go around in Syria, Iraq, all over, and they go and throw homosexuals off bridges. These guys, it's, it's, it's an ideology thing. They, these guys are radical. And why can't we ever call it what it is? Why has it become a race thing or a hate thing? No, this was an attack on American soil by a terrorist organization meant to do harm to Americans. Because like you said, those are Americans just like me and you. We might not be gay like them. We might have different views, but we still, at the end of the day, we love one another and we want the best for people. We do. I think the average person, an average person who grew up here in America, is not going to grow up a hateful person. The average person is going to grow up with a mutual, decent respect for other, other people. So. When you really try to categorize this, if you try to put this in a box, if you try to say it was a hate crime, it was this crime, yeah, is Islamic radicalism and all that, but at the end of the day, what I'm dealing with is the fact that I have to figure out who I know that was murdered and what funerals I'm attending this week because there is a very, very high chance that I do know some of the people whose names have not yet been released. Well, man, I'm sorry for what you had to go through, brother, man. That, that's horrible. You know, uh, no one ever thinks it's going to come here. I mean, wh what are your what are your viewpoints on the fact that a lot of the mainstream media is coming out and they're calling for more gun control, things like that? What are your thoughts on that? Do you think we should have a more well-armed populace? 
to make these kind of areas not a soft target, right. i.e. as in having armed security to you know take out a threat like that in case something happens. Right. Well, my personal opinion on that is that is something that is stimulating and kind of kicking up the fear that they want us to feel right now. And one message that I'm very serious about promoting is that me and every other citizen in Orlando, we're not going to live in fear. We are not going to let fear, we're not going to let terrorists think that they can cause us fear. We know that we've been attacked. We do want security to be beefed up. I'm actually going to have a show. We're actually um, putting on, before this happened, we were going to put on an EDM show, electronic dance music, and we were going to, now that I've had a phone call with everyone that's going to do that production, we're going to have a big moment of silence. And I want every last single citizen to know that we're going to be stronger. We've already donated over 5,000 5, people. have already donated blood. We are going to band together. We are not going to give into terrorism. We are going to be stronger because of this. And as far as securing us with guns and all that stuff, just just keep these people protected is all I have to say. I mean, it, whatever method, whatever money goes into that, however you do that, as long as we're out here being how we were before, promoting the love, peace, and harmony that we have and making sure that these kind of things don't happen, I really don't know where to categorize some type of homicidal maniac and what he's going to do. I just don't know how to do that. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me, man. It means a lot. And like I said, I'm sorry for what you're going through. Hopefully your buddy makes it through, and hopefully you don't have to hear any of the names of people that you do know. But if you do, man, I wish you all the best and stay strong and, you know, stay in there. Absolutely. This has been Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. While immediately following the Orlando terrorist attack, liberals were quick to blame guns and the National Rifle Association, not the killer and not Islamic terrorism. And indeed, Obama and Hillary Clinton immediately politicized this event, calling for further gun control while completely ignoring the elephant in the room. Hillary Clinton says, we know the gunmen used a weapon of war to shoot down at least 50 innocent Americans. And, you know, we won't even be able to get the Congress to prevent terrorists or people on the no-fly list from buying guns. So we can already tell that outlawing firearms is going to be central to her campaign following this attack. But here's a little tidbit of information for you, Hillary Clinton. Omar Mateen wasn't on a no-fly list. In fact, he worked for a company that was contracted to the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Army, and federal and local law enforcement. So they can't even vet the people who are in their midst. And also, as Kurt Nimmo points out, um, Omar used a an AR-15, which isn't considered to be a weapon of war because it's not fully automatic. So once again, she comes off as an idiot. And ill-informed. But this is actually a headline from Think Progress. This came out today. This is the gun that committed the deadliest shooting in U.S. history. Yes, it's the gun that committed this massacre. Not the killer, not religious intolerance, not radical beliefs, but an inanimate object. And so this is what they're really heavily pushing everyone. It's this gun that did it, not radical Islam. The Washington Post is now coming after Donald Trump, attacking him in a myriad of ways. But one of the headlines that stood out to me today was they said, Donald Trump's obsession with the phrase radical Islam won't defeat terrorism. Well, at least he isn't afraid to call it out because your obsession with gun control isn't going to stop terrorism and neither will covering your ears and closing your eyes and not daring to utter those words because you don't want to be offensive. And indeed, it's this not wanting to offend people that once again allowed another terror attack to take place. Hillary Clinton's State Department actually blocked an investigation into the Orlando Killer's mosque. This was the Fort Pierce Islamic Center where Mateen worshipped several times a week. It was under investigation by both the FBI and DHS as early as 2011 for ties to a worldwide Islamic movement that was linked to several terrorist organizations. But the investigation was shut down under pressure from the Clinton-ran State Department, as well as the DHS's Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Office, out of fear of offending Muslims. And this is according to a recently retired DHS agent, Philip Haney. He said that this was shut down 
because it unfairly singled out Muslims. And indeed, that's exactly what Mateen's co-worker said as well. He actually said he quit because this man's behavior was so unhinged, and he was reporting uh, Omar Mateen to his higher-ups, but they refused to do anything about it. They ignored because of political correctness. They were The bosses were too afraid. They refused to act out on uh, the, what this co-worker Coworker was saying he was actually talking about killing people, and the bosses refused to act on it because he was a Muslim. So once again, just like in San Bernardino, we're seeing political correctness is actually to blame for allowing another attack to take place. So we need to ban political correctness. But let's just say that they are able to ban guns. Well, I tweeted this out earlier and got a, a lot of response from this. So if we do ban guns, that means we're going to also have to ban roofs because jihadis seem to love throwing gay people off of them. Uh, but we're also going to have to ban pressure cookers, suicide vests, pipe bombs, knives, uh, plumbing equipment, propane tanks, cars. I mean, it goes on and on because the issue is we're going to have to ban everything until you out there can admit that Islam has a violence problem. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, we've been on scene for over 24 hours here in Orlando, Florida, where a gay nightclub was attacked by an ISIS terrorist, Omar Medin, 29 years old, born of two parents from Afghanistan. Now, we speculated this guy could have come from Pashtun background in the tribal regions of Afghanistan. And early this morning, we found out, we confirmed that that was the case. Now, we also had the ability earlier today, I spoke to numerous people people who were there, people who had friends who were there and visited them in the hospital and heard their stories of what happened inside the nightclub on that deadly attack. And these people said that they believe that there was more than just one gunman. Now we have this out of a local ABC 9 news report. I'm gonna pull it up really quick. It states this right here. Sources arrest expected soon of alleged accomplice in Orlando mass shooting. Omar Mateen, 29, opened fire at a gay nightclub in Orlando early Sunday, leaving at least 50 people dead and 53 wounded. Sources told Channel 9 Monday that law enforcement could make an arrest in the next few days of someone who helped the Orlando gunman carry out this mass shooting inside the Pulse nightclub, further validating the reports of the witnesses that were there that heard multiple guns going off at the same time. So what does that mean? Is this an activation? of terror cells nationwide. Now we heard three days ago, four days ago now, that Florida was a target and this was hit. There's gonna be a gay pride parade coming up this Friday in New Orleans. Could that be another possible target as well? Are they singling out the homosexual community or is just a, a hate-filled message to send to America to scare people, to keep them in their homes and to let our government completely just kind of run our lives because what happens when these attacks happen in San Bernardino, these other places, what's the first thing our government does? They want to call to disarm the American people and ISIS knows that. They're not stupid. They've survived this long. They're making a lot of money. They have the right idea. They know how to put fear in the eyes of the American people and they know that when they do that, the government's going to react the same way they always do, especially when you have a Democrat in the White House. Let's call for a gun sweep. Let's call for stricter gun control when our country already has some of the strictest gun control measures in various states where a lot of these attacks happen. At the end of the day, we need to be able to protect ourselves because guess what? There's bad people out there who want to do bad things to you. Why? Because you are an American. It has nothing to do with your sexual orientation. It has nothing to do with anything else except for the fact these people hate freedom, they hate the red, white, and blue, and they hate you. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now we're on scene of the crime that took place the other night, the horrific the terrorist attack that killed 50 and left 53 wounded who are still fighting for their lives as we speak right now. Lines of people are wrapping around different blood doning centers to give blood to help out these victims. And as you can see, tons of police vehicles about three, 400 yards down the road is actually where the club Pulse is, the nightclub where that attack took place. Now, just moments ago, there was a man over here in a fedora. He was one of the first people interviewed after the attack at the club early Sunday morning. 
and he was regurgitating the exact same stuff we hear all the time, sadly, uh, from these victims and these terrorist attacks. Um, the question that I would like to know is, are we going to have a, gun, a better gun control? I mean, as um, an individual who's able to just go out and purchase an assault weapon, I'm able to go and just have a heyday and go crazy, you know, with innocent people. They need more gun control, that stricter gun law should have been in place. How could this guy go out and get this assault rifle? They're, I mean, they're pretty much ignoring the facts. This guy worked for G4S, which is a security contracting company uh, that gets contracted out by the Department of Homeland Security. This guy had all the licensing that he needed, everything that he needed to go buy a gun legally and as quick as possible. You know, so this wasn't some like random guy who just went in and somehow snuck through the gun hole loop that people say exists or whatever that, that doesn't exist, which we've proven false time and time again, because at all those you have to go through background checks and all that. So if this guy had a clean slate his entire life up until now, he would have gotten through. More gun control is not gonna stop that. All it's gonna do is stop you, the individual, the person, from being able to protect yourself. And speaking of individual, the man kept saying that over and over as he was talking to the reporters about how this individual attacked them, not once calling this a radical Islamic extremist who killed those people because he hated homosexuals. Now we've seen in Saudi Arabia, they chop their heads off of swords, but no one's calling for a, a, you know, a sword ban or a sweep of swords across the country. No, that's okay. But here, an ISIS jihadi comes over here, dedicates his life to the Islamic State, and then murders a bunch of people, but let's blame guns. Let's not blame the fact that we have a problem with radical Islam in our world, and it's now inside of our country. It's declared war on us. We're gonna be out here reporting for the next day or so. Stay tuned for more reports as they happen. I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. Well, it's not just the Second Amendment and our right to keep and bear arms, it's the First Amendment and our free speech that is under attack from this very same incident. And of course, this is what we've seen over and over again. If the left disagrees with you on an issue, they don't argue with you. They simply try to silence you, to censor you. We saw this happen in the European Union. George Clooney's wife, Amal Clooney, who tried to jail a Turk who denied the Armenian genocide. Now, I disagree with the Turk. I think that the Armenian genocide certainly happened, but that's the way you combat it is in the free marketplace of ideas. You debate people, you show the facts. The facts can win, the truth can win out. But they tried to jail him simply because they didn't agree with his opinion, whether right or wrong. And now we see that happening in the wake of this event. Look at what Facebook did. They deleted Pamela Geller's Stop the Islamization of America page after the Orlando attack. Now this is a page that's been up for years, it has 50,000 members, they waited until the aftermath of this, and then Facebook shut it down. Facebook says the group, the uh, Stop the Islamization of America, has been removed because it violated our terms of use. And yet it's been operating for many, many years. Where did she report that? I think it's interesting to know the people who aren't censoring opinions. She had to go to Twitter to report that she had been censored by Facebook. Here's another censor uh, center, that is Reddit. Reddit bans users, deletes comments that say the Orlando terrorist was a Muslim. And of course, these are Reddit moderators who are actively banning users. Uh, they, anyone who discussed the Orlando nightclub terrorist uh, religion was shut down. We got a couple of examples of this. One user, Moonsprite, shared a screenshot of an article that he posted online simply saying, Orlando shooting suspect may have leanings to Islamic extremism, just leanings to it. And for that, he got banned from participating in Reddit news. And they say, you can still read it, but you can't put anything else out there. And he wasn't the only one who was banned. Uh, another individual tried to post an update when law enforcement officials raised the death count from 20 to 50, but that thread was deleted before he could finish the comment. So you see, this is the way that they are controlling the media. They used to control the media by having only three news organizations. The nightly news every night was ABC, CBS, or NBC. Now that the internet has broken out, we see them moving against it. And as I repeated earlier, the big gun grabber, Senator Markey out of Massachusetts, said that this guy was radicalized by the internet. He wasn't radicalized by Islam, according to him. He was radicalized by the internet. The internet needs to be controlled. Your guns need to be controlled. No, what they're trying to do is enact complete human control. They're trying to control you. 
Now, this last weekend, Julian Assange pointed out that Google is in bed with Hillary Clinton's campaign. That's another way that they control you, okay? It's not just uh, the social media sites, but it's also Google and what they show you when you look for news. He was speaking at a European journalism summit last Tuesday, and the WikiLeaks founder told attendees that Google is, quote, directly engaged with Hillary Clinton's campaign. He noted that in 2015, former Google CEO Eric Schmidt launched, quote, The Groundwork. That's the name of the organization. It's a startup specifically designed to get Clinton elected. He said Google is heavily integrated with the Washington power at personal levels and at a business level. He said the search engine has been gathering an increasing control over distribution channels through which voters take in news about the election. See, if they can control your social media, if they can control the search engines, if they can control what is trending, and that's what Facebook did, remember? They told everybody, oh, we're going to give you an honest reporting of what's trending. It's just a machine. It's going to look out there, tell you what other people are looking at. But they were manipulating that list. And of course, you know, it's a private thing. They can censor whoever they wish. They can manipulate it, but they were telling people that they were reporting what was trending, when in fact, they were manipulating. They were censoring some things that were trending that they didn't like, and they were putting some things that they did want to get out there to you that were not trending. Now, Assange also criticized, of course, Clinton's foreign policy, and I think this is something very important for Democrats as well as even Republicans to understand. He said, what we have with Clinton is someone who is a hawk but who has the tools of legal interventionism, a rhetorical cover to start wars, and someone who seemingly wants to start them. Yeah, she is a full-on warmonger. That's the reason why all of these people, the Never Trump people from National Review, all the neocons like Bill Kristol at the Weekly Standard, National Review, others, they're all saying, you know, I could live with Hillary Clinton more than I could Donald Trump. That's right. She'll give them their wars. She'll give them their globalist trade agreements that they negotiate in secret. She will give them the open borders that they want. Those are the critical issues. They'll let us argue about abortion. Isn't it interesting that no matter who gets elected, whether they're Democrat or Republican, nothing ever changes about abortion. The funding doesn't go up. The funding doesn't really go down. The laws don't change. Everything remains the same. But we fight over those issues when in reality, each election cycle, they have something very critical they want to accomplish. Like last time, it was Obamacare or Romney care because they were exactly the same thing. We'd seen Romney do it in Massachusetts. Now, we have published, and here's another example of it today on InfoWars, how special is Google's relationship with the White House? Say, Google has long ties to both Obama and Hillary. Google, they say, has turned into a traditional U.S. state power. Again, this is another quote from Julian Assange, pointing to the fact that CEO, former CEO Eric Schmidt is now heading the Pentagon Innovation Board. This is a report released by the Campaign for Accountability as part of its Google Transparency Project earlier this year, appears to confirm that the company enjoys a special relationship with Washington, and especially Obama and Hillary. They examined White House visitor logs. Google's top executives, employees, and representatives of associated entities visited the White House 427 times from January 2009 to October 31st, 2015. And of course, Eric Schmidt is a frequent visitor to Bilderberg as well. And in April, about uh, two months ago, we reported just how close are Obama and Google? You'll, you won't believe the answer. Here is an investigation as they were being looked at by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. This is an ethics watchdog investigation. Now they say the FTC at the upper levels may have misled Congress about how it protected Google, they highlight how the White House went into panic mode to limit the damage to Google. Last March, Google learned that the Wall Street Journal was about to publish details of how the Federal Trade Commission shut down an investigation into Google, contradicting some of the recommendations by its own investigators. Now, what happened with this was this information, just as we have seen uh, with a lawsuit against the TSA, they mistakenly published both the redacted and the unredacted version of some documents. Those documents showed that there was no threat at the time to airports or airplanes, even as they were threatening to turn Texas into a no-fly zone because we had legislation going through our state legislature that would have stopped those procedures. In the same way, the Wall Street Journal got a hold of this still redacted information. And I gotta say, why would you have an internal Federal Trade Commission Think, treated like it was a top secret document. Is that national security? I guess it is, because it's about Google.
So it is national security. They say the half-readable report nevertheless showed that staff had conducted an investigation of Google's behavior, similar to the one conducted by the European Union, which began in 2010. They concluded that Google was anti-competitive. They recommended the FTC press charges. The FTC staff concluded that Google had violated the Sherman Antitrust Act in three areas, and they continued and continuing behavior would have lasting negative effects on consumer welfare, but it was shut down by the upper brass. Isn't that interesting? And as we remember what we just told you about Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, being on a Pentagon advisory team, I think it's very interesting to look at this story that's from the Mirror via Drudge Report today. Robot, which can choose to harm humans, sparks an artificial intelligence debate. And they say, well, you know, going back to the iRobot series, you know, that was the Will Smith movie, but there's also the Isaac Asimov novels before that. They had uh, these different laws of robotics, and the first law was you cannot harm a human. So now they say, oh, this is kind of troubling. They're teaching the robots to actually harm a human. I have to say, don't you realize that Google bought all of the robotics companies that had any promise when DARPA did their robotics challenge? They are now a military robots supplier. Do you understand that the Pentagon and the Google robots are being used to set up autonomous killer robots. What's this about not harming humans? Of course they're going to harm humans. That's the design that they're coming up with. And then you look at this article, same day, MIT Technology Review, AI machines are undergoing psychological behavioral tests just like they do to us. This has been the focus of DARPA from day one. Well, that's it for tonight's nightly news. If you're watching this and you're not a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, please consider becoming one and supporting our operation here financially. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.